Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'm Indy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and Jed. And today we are actually live streaming on Jed's Twitch channel. So hello to his audience. And um, I think he might want to say a word about his... Yeah, there we go, this confetti. Um, and I, and uh, maybe he wants to say a word about his Twitch channel. Thank you so much, Mindy. Um, I have a Twitch channel called Awakening Philosophy, and we read the dialogues together, and we explore them and chat in real time. And I post those to my YouTube channel, which is also called Awakening Philosophy. If, if you want to join that, you're welcome to. We're reading the Phaedo at the moment, and Mindy has been really grateful and gracious to allow me to live stream these chats uh, on the channel. Well, this so chat. if you want to, <laughs> it, it's yes. this chat. Yes, it's not a regular. This channel. Yes. This is yeah. So like uh, so yeah. It's, this isn't a regular thing, but mm -hmm. she, she's letting me. Um, share with the viewers on my channel what we do here so thank mm -hmm. you so much mindy and i hope you enjoy uh if you're watching along uh in real time on twitch and for those watching this on all about platonism if they do want to watch your twitch live and they want to join in your conversations what time are you on oh um usually at around Four or five a.m. Australian uh, Eastern Time, which is—I um, have no idea what that is. California time. Okay, Sorry. Something. Well, right now in Florida, what time is it? Nine p.m. Nine p.m. So that would make it six p.m. on the West Coast in America. So a little more reasonable than the, the 4 a.m. <laughs> Australian time. Right. Mm -hmm. So 6 p.m. So right now it's 6 p.m. in California? Yes, on a Thursday. On a Thursday. Thursday so in California time around noon, I would say. Mm. I usually stream. But okay. it, it varies. <laughs> so just subscribe to the Twitch channel and get a notification okay. when I'm on. So it's Fair around enough. noon, 1 p.m. Mm. Fair enough. Okay, well, last week we went through the divided line, and it is a little confusing, and um, there's, it's very different from our usual way of thinking about these cognitive functions, and so that can make it confusing. So I want to just uh, run through it real quick as kind of a reminder, and then also maybe for those who were a little confused, maybe it will help clear some things up to just remember what the, the sections are. And then we're going to go right into the divide to, sorry, to the allegory of the cave. I think instead of going into more discussion here, it might actually make more sense, even if you still have questions, to go on to the allegory of the cave because the two fit together. And going on to the allegory might actually help clear up questions that you still have about the divided line. So that said, I am looking now at, um, what is this, 509D. And, oh, yes, I should say, I always say that we are using the Loeb translation. This is the uh, Paul Shorey translation in the Loeb Classical Library. If you do not have this physical version, there is a PDF in the description box. Okay, so looking at 509D, he says, represent them. So we're making um, this divided line diagram. And he says, um, there's a divided line into two equal sections. And cut each section again in the same ratio. And oh, by the way, he had set up the visible and the intelligible. And so this is what we're dividing up. And he tells us to do it in this way. And then as an expression of the ratio of their comparative clearness and obscurity, you will have as one of the sections in the visible world images. I labeled this as A last week. By images, I mean first shadows and then reflections in water and on surfaces of dense, smooth, and bright texture and everything of that kind. Okay, so that's section A. And then as the second section, assume that of which this is a likeness or an image. The animals about us and all plants and the whole class of objects made by man. So we have the animals, plants, and human-made objects as B, 
And then as we discussed last week, A is a reflection of those. And then he gave us this proportion. And proportion, remember, in Greek is the same word as analogy. So analogy or proportion. As is the opinable to the knowable, so is the likeness to that of which it is a likeness. And so we have this copy model going throughout the divided line. And then we looked at the other side. And first we got just a quick description, and then the next section he gives a little more detail. Um, so there's one section of it where this is the one I'm calling C, in which the soul is compelled to investigate by treating as images the things imitated in the former division. So take the images from B and use those in our contemplations. That's what he's calling understanding. And it proceeds not up to a first principle, but down to a conclusion. So never dropping the assumptions. The other section advances from its assumptions to a beginning or a principle that transcends assumptions. This is very difficult to grasp because most people have little to no experience working beyond assumptions. This is not a state of mind that most people, at least outside of the meditative world, would have much experience with. And it makes no use of the images employed by the other section, relying on ideas. This is eidos, not concepts. So, um, the forms or ideas or the absolute realities, using those only and progressing systematically through those um, realities. Now, Glaucon, remember, said he didn't understand, and so an example was given of geometry. And this is only an example, right? This could also apply to philosophers or to anybody else, really. Um, so there are some assumptions that we make from the start, and we take our start from these. And pursuing the inquiry from this point on, consistently, we conclude with that for the investigation of which they set out. So make some conclusions using those concepts, using those assumptions. And then he says, looking at now page um, 113, let me just grab look quickly what the Stephanus number is there. This is uh, 510D for those using a different translation. And do you not know that they further make use of the visible forms and talk about them, though they're not thinking of them, but of those things of which they are a likeness? And so this is also very much what we do in philosophy. Even if you're not drawing pictures, you have a concept of beauty, of justice, of equality, and so on. And working from that, but thinking about the thing in itself, we understand it's a concept of the things in themselves, even if we're not actually experiencing them. And so that's what he calls understanding. This is very difficult for many people because really much of what goes on in universities and what is, passes for knowledge is actually what Plato would call understanding. Very few people have any experience with section D. Um, and so going on then to section 21, he says here again, he's still in section C, he says that this is in the intelligible section, as you can see in the diagram, it's in the intelligible section, but it has two reservations. Um, or two caveats, you might say. The first one is that the soul is compelled to employ assumptions in the investigation of it, not proceeding to a first principle because of its inability to extricate itself from and rise above its assumptions. By the way, notice the word compel. We're going to see that again today as well. And uh, someone asked me an email about why we're compelled in certain places in the allegory of the cave. So we'll look at that when we get there. But we see it here as well. The soul is compelled to employ assumptions. So even when we want to be working beyond them, of course we're trying to, but it's not like you can just decide to drop your assumptions, right? It doesn't work. So we're compelled. And we have an inability at this stage in this cognitive functioning to extricate. The soul is unable to extricate itself from the assumptions and rise above them. Also, you may want to look back later on at the end of book five, where he talked about understanding or belief, sorry, belief and knowing as powers in the soul. 
that each have their own proper object. And that ties in here as well. Um, the second caveat he gave was that when we are, when the soul is functioning at the level of Dianoia, it uses as images or likenesses the very objects that are themselves copied and adumbrated in the class below them. So it's using B. And um, Glaucon thought he was only talking of geometry and kindred arts. Um, and Socrates went on, though, from there it was good enough. And he said, okay, the other section, that which the reason itself lays hold of, and that's actually logos in the Greek. The, the logos itself lays hold of by the power of dialectic. And so dialectic, pro we can use it earlier on, but... Its proper use is really here in the upper world, where this is going to correspond to the upper world. Um, and here, assumptions are not accepted. They're rather used more like hypotheses. They're not absolute beginnings. They're not principles or RK. They're hypotheses and a kind of a springboard to rise above them into a different kind of experience. And so... Again, here, um, <clears throat> we want to go to the starting point of all. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. Mm. <clears throat> the starting point of all. And after attaining to that, again, taking hold of the first dependencies from it, so to proceed downward to the conclusion, making no use whatever of any object of sense. So this is really the use of dialectic is going through the various absolute realities, edos, some ideas, forms, whatever word you want to use, and thinking, but not treating them as concepts. And so it's a very different state of mind. And um, pure ideas, moving on through ideas, two ideas, and ending with ideas. And then he labeled them. At the very end, um, Glaucon gave his understanding. Socrates called it sufficient. And so now the very last paragraph of Book 6, we're given these labels that you can see on the chart there. Conjecture, belief, understanding, and intellection. Or knowledge. Uh, now it's very hard looking at this to see, for example, B. These, he's describing physical things, animals, plants, human-made objects. And so to label that as belief is a rather strange thing. I think we can all agree. And to call the shadows and the reflections of these things conjecture also seems strange. And then on the other half of the diagram, we have different... These fit the idea of cognitive functions a little bit better. But still, the idea of understanding actually fits most people's notion of knowledge. And what he calls knowledge or intellection is like, most people just have no idea what that is. And so every section of this divided line, I think, is quite confusing. Um, but we're going to go on. <laughs> we can always come back to it. But I think if we go on to the allegory, then it will help clear up some of the problems here. And then we can also, once we've done both of them, maybe next week, we'll be able to look at the two together. Okay, so we will be coming back to it. We're not leaving it entirely, but we are going to move on to the allegory of the cave. So any questions or comments before we go on? I don't mean to rush you. We're good? Okay. All right. So our usual roles? Yes? Okay, so Jacob, okay, whenever you're ready. Next, compare our nature in respect of education and its lack to such an experience as this. Picture men dwelling in a sort of subterranean cavern with a long entrance open to the light on its entire width. Conceive them as having their legs and necks bettered from childhood so that they remain in the same spot, able to look forward only, and prevented by the fetters from turning their heads. 
Picture further the light from a fire burning higher up and at a distance behind them, and between the fire and the prisoners, and above them a road along which a low wall has been built. As the exhibitors of puppet shows have partitions before the men themselves, above which they show the puppets. All that I see. See also then, men carrying past the wall implements of all kinds that rise above the wall, and human images and shapes of animals as well, wrought in stone and wood and every material. Some of these bearers presumably speaking and others silent. A strange image you speak of, and strange prisoners. Like to us. For, to begin with, tell me, do you think that these men would have seen anything of themselves or of one another except the shadows cast from the fire on the wall of the cave that fronted them? How could they? if they were compelled to hold their heads unmoved through life. And again, would not the same be true of the objects carried past them? Surely. If then they were able to talk to one another, don't you, do you not think that they would suppose that in naming the things that they saw they were naming the passing objects? Necessarily. And if their purse or sorry, and if their prison had an echo from the wall opposite them, when one of the passer by passers by uttered a sound, do you think that they would suppose anything else than the passing shadow to be the speaker? By Zeus, I do not. Then in every way such prisoners would deem reality to be nothing else than the shadows of the artificial objects. Quite inevitably. Consider then, what would be the manner of the release and healing from these bonds and this folly if in the course of nature, something of this sort should happen to them. When one was freed from his fetters and compelled to stand up suddenly and turn his head around and walk and to lift up his eyes to the light, and in doing all this felt pain and because of the dazzle and glitter of the light, was unable to discern the objects whose shadows he formerly saw. What do you suppose would be his answer if someone told him that what he had seen before was all a cheat and an illusion, but that now, being nearer to reality and turned towards more real things, he saw more truly? And if also one should point out to him each of the passing objects and constrain him by questions to say what it is, do you not think that he would be at a loss and that he would regard what he formerly saw as more real than the things now pointed out to him? Far more real. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. Obviously, we haven't gotten the whole allegory yet, but just to make sure we got the setup, we'll go through this first section. Um, so we're comparing our nature in respect of education and its lack. The word education here is paideia, and I'm told that this is different from our notion of secular education. It's more like a yoga or spiritual discipline. This would be the word they would use. So this is what he means by education. And so we have people dwelling in a cave. So I have a diagram here um, to try to help us out. I hope it's streaming correctly. Yes? You both see it? Okay. 
Good. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we see the people in the cave. And notice that there's a long entrance here. This doesn't look very long, but it's a long entrance. And, and there's a light that can be seen through the entire entrance there. Okay, so that's the first light that is introduced in the cave. And that would be the sunlight. And then they have, so then the people in the cave, they have their legs and necks fettered from childhood. Notice it's not from birth, it's from childhood. So there's a question, right, of why that is. And they remain in the same spot. And they can only look forward. So they're prevented by the fetters from turning their heads. So all they can see then is the wall in front of them. Now there is a second light. Other than the sunlight, there's also the light from a fire that's burning higher up and at a distance behind them. And so you see that in the picture there. And then between the fire and the prisoners, you see, a, they call it a road, um, and it's a, along a low wall. And, the, um, and then you see, like, there's like a little puppet show going on. Right. And they're showing the puppets. Okay, so very strange image here. Um, now, the men carrying past the wall implements of all kinds that rise above the wall human images and shapes of animals as well. Which category does that sound like in, in the divided line? Where did we see that idea of animals and human-made objects and... Belief. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, some are speaking and others are silent. Okay. Okay, so we've got that much built so far. We haven't got the rest of the allegory yet, but so far that's as far as he's gotten. And then let's see what he says about it up to this point. Um, do you think these men would have seen anything of themselves? Would they know what they look like? Or of one another, except the shadows cast from the fire on the wall? Right? How could they if they were compelled? And there's that word compelled. It's going to come up a few times. If they were compelled to hold their heads unmoved through life. Right? So we have this image that all they see are the shadows. They don't know their own selves. They don't know each other. They don't know any real people. They only know the shadows. And again, would not the same be true of the objects carried past them? Those objects also, they can't see them because they're behind them. All they see are the shadows. If then they were able to talk to one another, do you not think they would suppose that in naming the things that they saw, they were naming the passing objects? Right? So they're naming the shadows and they think the shadows are the things, but they're actually not. They're just the shadows of the things. And then if the prison had an echo from the wall opposite them, when one of the passers-by uttered a sound, do you think that they would suppose anything else than the passing shadow to be the speaker? So they're hearing voices, and they assume the shadows are talking because they think the shadows are real. Right. Then in every way such prisoners would deem reality to be nothing else than the shadows of the artificial objects. Okay. Um, it is a little strange that he put artificial. There's a reason for it. But at this point, it's a question mark because he said there are trees and animals and real things as well as human made objects. So there is the question of why he called them artificial. Okay, so that's another question to hold on to. Consider then what would be the manner of the release and healing from these bonds and this folly. If in the course of nature something of this sort should happen to them, 
So notice he's not actually saying how a person gets released. It's in the course of nature. And somehow, then somebody was freed. Notice it's passive voice. The person was freed. We don't know how. And the person was compelled. And there's the word again. Compelled to stand up suddenly and turn his head around and walk and to lift up his eyes to the light. And doing all this, he would feel pain because he's never seen light. He's never looked at a light before. He's only seen reflections of light bouncing off the wall of the cave. He's never looked at a fire before. And because of the dazzling glitter of the light, he would be unable to discern the objects whose shadows he formerly saw. In other words, he couldn't see those objects being carried behind the wall. Now, what do you suppose would be his answer if someone told him that what he had seen before was all a cheat and an illusion? But that now, being near to reality, in turn toward more real things, and so the things in the cave are more real. So we're bringing in ontological levels. This is introducing, this is why we can have an ontological reading as well as an epistemological reading of the allegory, right? Because things are more real. And if one should also point out to him each of the passing objects and constrain him by questions to say what each is, what is that real thing? Do you not think he would be at a loss and that he would regard what he formerly saw, the shadows, as more real than the things that are now pointed out to him. Okay, now we, I think it would be too soon to try to label things and really um, describe what's going on here, but we want to be clear of what the steps are that Socrates is describing. Because right, we've got a whole lot to unpack still, but as long as we're clear on what he's describing, the image he's describing, without necessarily knowing what it all means, if we're clear what he's describing, that's enough to go on. Are there any questions at this point about what he's describing? We got the picture? Okay. Good. Okay. Then let's go on to section two and get a little bit more of this very strange um, description here, this very strange story. And if he were compelled to look at the light itself, would not that pain his eyes? And would he not turn away and flee to those things which he is able to discern and regard them as in very deed more clear and exact than the objects pointed out? It is so. And if someone should drag him thence by force up the ascent, which is rough and steep, and not let him go before he had drawn him out into the light of the sun, do you not think that he would find it painful to be so hauled along, and would chafe at it, and when he came out into the light, that his eyes would be filled with its beams, so that he would not be able to see even one of the things that we call real? Why, no, not immediately. Then there would be need of habituation, I take it, to enable him to see the things higher up. And at first he would most easily discern the shadows, and after that the likenesses, or reflections in water, of men and other things and later the things themselves, and from these he would go on to contemplate the appearances in the heavens and heaven itself, more easily by night, looking at the light of the stars and the moon, then by day, the sun and the sun's light. Of course. 
And so, finally, I suppose, he would be able to look upon the sun itself and see its true nature, not by reflections in water or phantasms of it in an alien setting, but in and by itself in its own place. Necessarily. And at this point, he would infer and conclude that this it is that... Sorry. And at this point, he would infer and conclude that this it is that provides the seasons and the courses of the year and presides over all things in the visible region and is in some sort the cause of all these things that they had seen. Obviously, that would be the next step. Well then, if he recalled to mind his first habituation and what passed for wisdom there, and his fellow bondsmen, do you not think that he would count himself happy in the change and pity them? He would indeed. And if there had been honors and commendations among them, which they bestowed on one another, and prizes for the man who is quickest to make out the shadows as they pass, and best able to remember their customary precedences, sequences, and coexistences, and so most su successful in guessing at what was to come, do you think he would be very keen about such rewards, and that he would envy and emulate those who were honored by these prisoners and lorded it among them, or that he would feel with Homer and greatly prefer, while living on earth, to be a serf or another, a landless man, and endure anything rather than opine with them and live that life? Yes, I think he would choose to endure anything rather than such a life. And consider this also. If such a one should go down again and take his old place, would he not get his eyes full of darkness, thus suddenly coming out of the sunlight? He would indeed. Now, if he should be required to contend with these perpetual prisoners in evaluating these shadows, while his vision was still dim and before his eyes were accustomed to the dark, and this time required for habituation would not be very short, would he not provoke laughter, and would it not be said of him that he had returned from his journey aloft with his eyes ruined, and that it was not worth while even to attempt the ascent? And if it were possible to lay hands on and to kill the man who tried to release them and lead them up, would they not kill him? They certainly would. Okay, okay so this gives us then the other half, I guess you could say, of the allegory, um, going to the upper world. Okay, so here we have a person who has been freed of their shackles and has looked around the cave. And it's at, we, when we left him at the end of section one, he was very confused. Um, if he were compelled then to look at the light itself, would that not pain his eyes? He would not be able to turn away and flee to those things which he was able to discern and regard them. And would he not turn away, sorry, and flee to those things which he is able to discern and regard them as in very deed more clear and exact than the objects pointed out. Okay, so again, there's that whole process of being questioned about what is going on in this cave. And I think that we can see many parallels here to the beginning of the spiritual journey, right? Where we're tied to the body and looking at shadows on a wall. And when we let the, when the shackles drop and we can look around this cave, um, it is souls looking around, right? The shackles are like the body 
and when there's a drop and you can look around as a soul, you're seeing things that only the soul can see. But you don't know what you're looking at because there's nothing in your experience that allows you to see these things. And so this is the experience that he's having at this point. And then if someone should drag him thence by force up the ascent, it's hard to see in this picture here, but I think behind this wall here where the fire is, there's an ascent and you can kind of see some people on this end of the ascent here. Um, but there's this long ascent here. And if somebody were to drag him up and it's rough and steep, and they won't let him go till he had been dragged out into the light of the sun. I added the sun, of course, to this picture here that wasn't in there, but I think we need a sun. Um, and if they could drag him out to the light, it would be painful. So notice there's a lot of pain involved in this whole process. It's not a fun process. The person is feeling a lot of pain. And if they're held along and they would chafe at it, they'd be annoyed at it. And when he came out into the light, his eyes would be filled with its beams, and he could not see one of the things that we call real. So these are the objects that are real. This is that second half of the um, divided line. Okay, these are the objects that are real. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> he would need to get used to it, some need for habituation, to enable him to see the things higher up. And then he would go through a little process of adjusting to it. Now you can go back through this. I'm not going to do this together, but you can think about what each of these represents. But anyway, there's a process of habituation um, where he would first see things, you know, in reflections at night and then eventually um, seeing things by day. And then finally the sun and the sun's light. <clears throat> Now, by the way, I should have said this before, but <clears throat> in, the, in the divided line in book six, we saw the sun representing the world, the visible world. Here, notice the sun is outside the intelligible world. So the sun is being used differently. What represents, so the sun as it was used in book six, what represents that in the allegory of the cave? <clears throat> There are two lights in it. Is it the fire in the cave? Exactly. Right. Okay. Yes. So the fire is the light in the visible world in the cave. The cave is like the visible world. Right. So the world of vision is lit by the sun. Or I'm sorry, by the fire. And then the upper world, the intelligible world. So that's confusing part, and I think that's also why some people will confuse the offspring of the good with, um, what did he call it, and the idea of the good, right? He confused those, those, it's, I think you can, when you first read it, it's easy to think that they're the same thing. And in, part of the reason is this, because here the sun is the idea of good, but in the earlier parts, um, the son was the offspring of the good, and they're different. So that's confusing. Okay. Um, was there something you wanted to say, Jed? Yeah. Um, so in the divided line, we had belief tied to man-made objects mm -hmm. and animals and things, mm -hmm. which is a puzzle because that's not a cognitive function, doesn't mm -hmm. fit. But then right after, we have the man-made objects uh, and objects of animals carried on the heads of people. Mm -hmm. So we can see, oh, I know, I know what he's doing. He's saying you have to weave this in. This doesn't fit, but it connects it with this other thing. And I like that. I, I, I like that as like we're learning how we pu puzzle solve. And when you bring in the idea of chains mm -hmm. being shackled to the body, mm -hmm. that's another text where he uses chains in the Phaedo and he specifically says our body is like shackles we need to free our soul from. Mm -hmm. So you can even weave in other texts mm -hmm. um, to make sense of certain things. Mm -hmm. But in the divided line, the 
th- those things were beliefs. Beliefs were being carried on the head and man-made objects, which makes sense because mm-hmm. if you're only in the physical world, you're following man-made beliefs. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about the great monster, the beliefs of the many. Um, but the images mm-hmm. are the things that we see with our physical senses. Mm-hmm. So the firelight gives visibility to beliefs, whereas the sun gives visibility to physical things. So I'm not sure whether the the fire represents the sun, but I mean, it does in the sense that it, yeah, see, the cause of the shadows would be the physical sun, I would Mm -hmm. say. I don't know what that would be. Whereas the fire seems to be something that gives illumination to the beliefs, the things carried on the head. Section B of the divided line. I, I didn't quite catch what you were saying there. Oh, um, so even though the fire mm-hmm. is kind of like the sun in book six, mm-hmm. in that there's light involved, mm-hmm. um, the, the physical sun in book six would be the cause of the shadows, mm-hmm. the visibility of the shadows on the wall. The firelight in the cave illuminates belief. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure if the fire represents the physical sun or something mm-hmm. that illuminates belief, because mm-hmm. beliefs are not physical. Mm. Well, okay, we can go into this here. Um, so we're seeing we, different realms of reality. I remember he said that when, you, that when the person stands up, what they're seeing is more real. And that tells us that we're looking at realms of reality. And... Um, if we're going from our physical realm up, we can look at various realms and see each one is more real than the one before it. There's a likeness that runs through all, but the realms are, um, each one is, it is a likeness that it, well, when we're going downward, um, each one as it unfolds, going from the top down, there's a likeness that runs through all, but there's a greater differentiation, there's a greater diffusion. And so the next realm is, you might say, less real, because reality itself is the upper world. Our realm, like our physical world or the world of the cave, has a mode of reality, but it's removed from reality itself. And keeping that in mind, when we look at this diagram, then we can see the wall as being like the material realm. And the material Mm. realm is described as being a receiver of reason principles. Uh, we can talk about Eidos outside the cave. We talk about reason principles in the cave. Um, and we can talk about natural and psychical reason principles. And those are cast on the wall. So the wall, the material realm is the final realm. It doesn't create anything of its own, but it is a receiver of reason principles. And so it's said to have a certain intelligibility in that sense. We can see these objects here, if we're looking at this ontologically, as being like the um, reason principles of the natural realm. And so we have like animals and trees and things like this. They're not real, though, in the ultimate sense. And so that's why they're still artificial. That's why I would argue he calls them artificial. And so these cast their shadows we think we're seeing um, physical things, but we know from our science now that there really are no physical objects. Right? We have beliefs about physical objects, and those beliefs then um, influence what we see when we look around us. We believe there are physical objects, and that, and then we we see what you no know, seeing is. Believing is seeing is actually more accurate. Um, Believing is seeing. And that actually fits in. Let me go back for a moment here. Why does he label them the way he does? You have, he says that your beliefs, let me go back to an earlier one. Um, The opinable is to the knowable as the copy is to the model. Right, so B is the model and A is the copy. 
and it's your beliefs about physical objects that result in the conjectures we make of the physical world around us and our sensual world. And we can see that here, that um, we believe these objects are real, and that's why we interpret the shadows as real. Okay, so that's what he's showing here. And you're seeing there a connection then between the cognitive functions and the ontological realms. And so the fire in the ontological reading then would be like the soul, the realm of soul that has power in the physical realm. That's what oversees the physical realm. It, soul is kind of like a, it has a middle place where it gets its power from above and it can participate certainly in noose and it has its existence in, re in eternity but it has its activity here in the cave in the physical world and it has kind of a middle place and it's that power um, so in the ontological reading what is um, oh, sorry, sorry, keep going. Okay, so it has its ontological reading as like the realm of soul, and that's what gives power then to um, the objects in the natural world to cast their shadow on the wall. Um, <clears throat> in the epistemological reading, you can see it, yes, that that's the power of belief. We get our, it somehow functions as a power of belief to cast those shadows. And so you do have to ask yourself what it is about that. No, my doorbell just rang. Would you excuse me just a second, second? There's something that gives the power of our soul to project. So in one sense, it's like the sun in that there needs to be a cause of shadows. So there has mm -hmm. to be something to physically see things. But in another sense, the fire represents the soul's ability to uh, conceive through projections of beliefs. But I was seeing a third level... Um, a kind of a negative sense that um, uh, there's something that gives power to our beliefs that are not real, that are just carried on the heads of other dudes, um, g uh, allows us to mistake that as being real when it's not. Projection in a negative sense. Yeah, and also keep in mind, though, that the people are talking to each other. And so it is the very nature of the unfolding of reality that as we get further away from reality itself, I think of it like a net. As you, as you stretch the net, the holes get bigger and bigger. So you're allowing falsehood in. And it's just the very nature of reality that falsehood is going to work in. Um, I don't think of it as a negative thing, but more as like um, necessity. And so when the people are talking to each other because they don't know what is behind them, they only know the wall in front of them. It's natural that they're going to um, have these, um, make, make these errors. And so that's that works it in, in that way as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, okay, so then we were here looking at the upper world. So this person then is very confused and looking around this cave and not understanding what they're seeing and getting dragged up that steep, rough, steep ascent, um, if they were compelled to, to look at the light itself, there'd be more pain, and they want to flee back to what's familiar to them. And I think this is an experience that anybody in a... Oh, there's some construction outside. I'm sorry if you hear this sound. Um, but anybody who's doing any kind of a wisdom tradition um, will know this feeling of um, when things get strange, you want to run back to what is familiar. And there may be this back and forth pull for a while. And so that's what's going on here. And the person is being dragged, forced up the ascent. And it's rough and steep for this person. But they finally come out into the light. And so that's like the person up here who's finally come out. They've gone up here and they finally come out. You can see it's a difficult climb. And then they would have to adjust themselves to what they're seeing in the upper world. And so finally, I suppose, he would be able to look upon the sun itself 
and see its true nature. And so that's this sun here, looking to the sun itself and seeing its true nature. Not by reflections in water or phantasms of it in an alien setting, but in and by itself, in its own place. Here, place is not a physical place, of course, because it's not a physical thing, but seeing it in, on its own. And um, we do use place in the intelligible world, but it has a, a different feel to it, so it's something to hold on to there. Um, and then he would infer and conclude that it is this, that this it is, this sun it is, that provides the seasons and the courses of the year and presides over all things in the visible region. So this is the ultimate power that gives the power to the fire that's, that, that you know, ultimately, you know, um, casts those shadows on the wall. But this is that ultimate power and presides over all things in the visible region. And it's in some sort the cause of all these things that they had seen. So somehow this is a cause. And then he's, and Glaucon says, yes, that would be the next step. Okay, and then if he recall to mind his first habitation and what passed for wisdom there when he was chained and his fellow bondsmen, do you not think that he would count himself happy in the change and that he would pity them? Do you think he would? We agree he would. Oh, yeah. He would, he would pity them because, you know, <laughs> yes. experiencing isn't real. And then we're imagining what was going on back when he was chained. What is that world like? There were honors and commendations among them. They would bestow them on one another and prizes for the man who's quickest to make out the shadows as they pass and best able to remember their customary precedences and sequences and coexistences. And so successful in guessing what was to come. And we know people like this, right? There are people in society who are considered very good at reading social cues and whatnot. Um, they're very much caught up in that conventional world and think that they have some great knowledge or, or talent at least. Um, and then playing he would, the stock market. I'm sorry, what? Playing the stock market, guessing exactly. what's going to come. Yes, that's a good example. Yeah. And do you think he would be very keen about such rewards so that he would envy and emulate those who were honored by these prisoners? Would he lord it among them? Um, how would he feel? Yeah. Um, then there's this mention, by the way, of Homer. I, forgot to pull out the first half of the of of the dialogue but there's this reference here that Homer greatly prefer while living on earth to be serf of another a landless man and endure anything rather than opine with them and live that life that quote actually came up um, I'll give you the Stephanus number it's 386 C so you can look it up later but that's where he was discussing the um, the laws and the way the gods should talk and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable of the way the gods talk, it was used in a very different way there. So you can compare them. And here you see it's using it very differently. So it's very curious how he threw it in here. Um, but here we're seeing another way of that. What he's describing is that he would prefer that. It's better to have that than to live as... Um, as to, to live as the prisoners in the cave. Mm. Right. Um, consider this also, if such a one would go down again and take his old place. And by the way, if, if you compare those two, you'll see that before he was describing it as like the world of Hades is so terrible. Like I would rather, um, like death is so horrible, I'd rather be a a slave then you know be down there but now we're seeing he's talking about it very differently so it's cleared up now it. mm. you'd, you'd rather be in the other world mm. 
has the lowest status than mm. be anything mm. in this physical world. He's flipped mm. it around. Mm -hmm. And if such a one should go down again and take his old place, his eyes would be full of darkness now. And they would look at him and they would laugh at him. He would provoke laughter from them. And they would say that re he returned from his journey aloft with his eyes ruined and that he was, it was not worthwhile even to attempt the ascent. And this very much fits the way many people's experiences are, isn't it, of a, a spiritual journey. It's not understood. I think it's getting a little bit more acceptable these days, but still, depending on your family and your neighborhood, um, there's a lot of resistance to it. A lot, you know, it's, as we saw in some of the earlier sections, there's still the idea that, um, you know, philosophy may be fun to dabble in, but you don't want to take it too seriously. And people feel the same way about any kind of wisdom tradition, um, any kind of spiritual or mystic tradition. Right. It may be fun to do, you know, maybe it's good to do a little bit of yoga or meditation for stress release or something. But, you know, you don't want to take it too seriously. Yeah. And I also like what you mentioned about the people who are good at seeing in the dark are attuned to social cues and things. Mm -hmm. And once you get interested in philosophy, you might forget about like how to how to bully people and how to like make fun of people and social status and all this social crap. It's no longer interesting to you. And so you, you come back with all this enthusiasm mm -hmm. to talk about philosophy mm -hmm. and there being a real world. Hey guys, you know, there's a real world that we can access because we have consciousness and then they, they make fun of you. Ah, well, we're going to pick on you and you're not good. Like, mm -hmm. don't you know that you shouldn't share that sort of things? You're making mm -hmm. yourself a target. Mm -hmm. So they make fun of you for not, playing the the game as well you're kind of blinded by the light and you can't see mm -hmm. well in the dark as them and that's another thing that people who discover philosophy or this experience uh, encounter mm -hmm. right yeah exactly yeah and pop culture is like totally over my head i have no idea i see sometimes and i'm like scrolling through videos on youtube um, there's like, you know, some pop culture, like these two people are fighting and it's like, I don't know either one of them. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> and it's like, I, I'm not going to click on that one. So, um, but those have a lot of clicks on them. A lot more than the videos I watch. <laughs> I know. Isn't that yeah. amazing? Mm, yeah. Um, so yeah, they'll say this person ruined his eyes and no one should attempt that ascent and. If it were possible to lay hands on and kill the man who tried to release them and lead them up, would they not kill him? Now, by the way, um, back when we were looking at some earlier sections, I remember there was a section I said, oh, yeah, this actually is kind of foreshadowing the allegory of the cave. And I want to take you back to see something here. Um, back on page 123. And this is uh, 515D, for those using a different translation. Um, when one was freed from his fetters and compelled to stand up suddenly and turn his head around and walk and to lift up his eyes to the light, and in doing all this felt pain and because of the dazzling glitter was unable to discern the objects, what do you suppose would be his answer if someone, doesn't tell you who, doesn't say much about this person, just kind of throws it in, if someone told him that what he had seen before was all a cheat and an illusion, and that now being near to reality and turned toward more real things, he saw more truly. Uh, we got a few things here. First of all, this idea of being compelled. Why would the person be compelled to stand up suddenly? There's nothing here to describe it, but if we look at this as from our own experience, um, we've all gone at least this far in our journey because you wouldn't be here if you hadn't gone this far. So what compels a person to stand up and turn their head and look around? Well, in my experience, it was another person hmm. uh, convinced me to okay. start, start down this path. Hmm. So someone like this, someone, this mysterious, oops. 
mysterious someone. My highlighter's not working. Yeah. Right. Right. So there has to be... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, yeah. Uh, I think... I suspect that. And then at the end of 7-2, it definitely seems like he's talking about a kind of Socrates figure when he is mentioning mm. that they would put this mm. person to death. Right. They... Sounds like foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. There has to be some experience or some person who challenges you. Something compels you. Some feeling, maybe, that you've been carrying all your life. I'm going to jump back here for a moment to, this is page 45 in the book, and this is screen 119 for those using the PDF. Um, let me tell let me check what the Stephanus number is. Uh, 494D. He's describing the difficulties people have with philosophy, why they don't like it. So we're imagining somebody who's well-born and handsome and tall, um, <clears throat> filled with ambitious hopes. And if to a man in this state of mind, he says... Are we all on the same page? <clears throat> Someone okay. six five blue eyes works in finance. Yes, this, this this is like that person who knew back in high school that he wanted to be a stockbroker. Yeah, I, I knew a few of those. I never understood those people. Um, if to a man in this state of mind, someone gently comes and tells him what is the truth, and that he has no sense and he sorely needs it. And that the only way to get it is to work like a slave to win it. Do you think it will be easy for him to lend an air to the quiet voice in the midst of and in spite of these evil surroundings? Far from it. Okay, so we talked about how this can also be like the voice of the daimon and how the teacher functions kind of as a human daimon. And so there is that parallel. But we can certainly see this as a person, right? And this is like a Socratic figure. So a someone. And let me go back now. And we also talked about the mm -hmm. opposite. If you failed, if you weren't born 6'5", blue eyes, mm. uh, with a trust fund, um, <laughs> maybe that's for your benefit. Or if you mm -hmm. didn't succeed at school or you didn't get the, mm -hmm. the athlete you, the athlete you wanted to become or, or you didn't fit in with your religious tradition, we talked about that actually being mm -hmm. a, a boon uh, mm -hmm. because it might allow mm. you to discover this, the mm. real work. Mm. So um, That's right. to yeah. people out there who, who suck at things, you're actually good doing well. <laughs> yeah, good for you. Yeah. And if mm. we go back to where we were before, and again, that screen 197, if you're using this PDF. Um, and this, so the idea of feeling compelled also kind of adds to what Jed was saying, that if you feel that compelled, whatever your circumstances are, whether you're a trust fund baby or you're very poor, whether you're beautiful or not so attractive, whatever your circumstances, if you feel compelled to stand up and look around, to drop those fetters and look around, you're going to find that your situation works for you. When we find ourselves saying, well, if only I had this situation or if only I had that, we still have something to work through. Once you feel that um, impulse, once you have that motivation to wake up, you will make your circumstances work. They're always the perfect, they're always, somehow they're always the perfect circumstances for you to wake up. You can wake up in any circumstance. Mm -hmm. But that feeling of being compelled is a key here, right? That you have to feel that inner motivation. Right? Um, yeah, and so this person is quite shocked um, to, um, at this stage here, to look around the cave and to discover how strange it all is. Now, there are many different ways to read this, and I think that Jed was pointing to one that's also um, a perfectly valid one, and it's one that's very consistent with the way Dr. Grimes talked about it, that this is each our own personal cave. If you're looking at the cave of society, all these people chained together, then it's kind of hard to say that the people walking with items are your family or something. But if we each have our own cave and you see each of us going through our own 
individual struggle. And this is supported, by the way. Let me jump. I'm, I'm kind of jumping around here. Sorry. Um, and if someone should drag him thence by force up the ascent, which is rough and steep, and let him not let him go. Each of us is being dragged by ourselves, right? And when we look at the... Um, at the divided line, we see that we each have our own assumptions and we each have our own interpretation of things. Um, if there are a hundred people watching this, well, that would be great if there are a hundred people. Say there are 10 people watching this. If there are 10 people watching this on YouTube, then they'll be walking away with 10 different ideas of what it all means. And there'll be a lot of overlap. Hopefully we're all more or less on the same page, but we all have our own ideas. Right. And that's also why even like looking at the divided line was very confusing because we have our own ideas and then new things challenge what's in the book may challenge that and it doesn't quite fit and it gets confusing. And we all have our own interpretation. We're all trying to make sense of it based on what we came to it with, with our ideas. Right. And that's section C. That's Dianoia. That's how it functions. And so we all have our own interpretation, which means we all kind of have our own cave. Mm. Now, when we look at it that way, then this is the way Dr. Grimes often talked about it. And I think that's where, where, where Jed was going, is that the, the power that we see the fire is the power of belief. And the people walking are like our family. And they're walking, they, their beliefs are what they're carrying. And I'm told that somewhere in this, I don't recall where it is, but the statues are described with the Greek word agalma. And agalma is like a statue for a god. And that's a very curious way to describe these statues because our family beliefs are like their god. Like you tell somebody their belief is wrong and they're ready to kill you. They will crucify mm -hmm. you. And so, because it is like a belief, you're attacking their god. <laughs> um, and so... When you see it that way, then you can see that fire is the power of belief. And it's, it's what we've been taught since childhood. And so the shadows we're seeing, are the wor it's the world as we are taught to see it. And so that world of belief. And so that's another level at which you can see this. And then the voices. What would the voices be that you're hearing? Bouncing around the cave, bouncing around your head. What are the voices in your head? your inner monologue hmm. where does that come from what are those voices that inner critic we call it right what is that mm -hmm. in in the allegory of the cave who whose voices are they do you remember where was that the, the well the prisoners echo their voices, but also mm. the people holding the objects mm, speak good. as yes. those objects. Right. Sometimes. Does anyone remember where that is? If prisoners had an echo, when one of the passers by, so this is at the top of page 123. So could it be like the sound of mum and dad fighting when you're trying to watch Full House after school? <laughs> That's a really specific example there. <laughs> you like Full House, huh? Okay, so 515B. I'm sorry, what was Oh, trying to play Mario and mm -hmm. you hear mum and dad mm -hmm. yelling about something in the background and that echoes and... He just realized he didn't want that... to admit he likes Full House. No, 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 no. I hate Full House. <laughs> I, like, I like video games. I like Mario. Uh -huh. That Right, guys? Yeah. I guess. Mm. Yeah. Uh, when one of the passers-by uttered a sound, do you think they would suppose it anything else than the passing shadows to be the speaker? Right, so if we're seeing those passers-by as our parents, our teachers, our religious leaders, or anyone in the community who influences us, um, if they're the ones carrying beliefs on their heads, then their voices are the ones bouncing around. And oftentimes, you know, when you, if there is a voice that repeats itself, and we learn this in midwifery, um, in philosophical midwifery, 
that if there is a voice that keeps playing itself out, you want to look at when, when does it pop up? What are you doing when that voice pops up, first of all? And you can see what triggers it. And then secondly, you want to ask yourself, who does that sound like? You may be hearing somebody from your university days or somebody from work, but that voice sticks in your mind because it echoes somebody from your childhood. Maybe mom, maybe dad, maybe teacher, maybe uncle. But it, there's some reason it ties to childhood. And so that's one way to do midwifery. That's one of the ways that we may um, initiate a midwifery session is looking at such a voice. And I love that mm -hmm. because that's the voice mm -hmm. that we project onto others. Someone mm -hmm. will be walking past and you'll imagine that's what they're thinking mm -hmm. about you. Oh, yeah. But it's not, yeah, it's not the actual shadows. They're just echoing mm. the uh, your, your parents or your mm. upbringing or whatever. Yes. And so, yeah, I guess, I guess like that, that's, that's what binds you. That's what chains you. The fear that people would think mm. this and that, mm. but it's the, it's the bouncing off the mm. echoes of, you know, yes. mom and dad arguing or telling you this or that, but yes. it's a projection onto mm -hmm. other people. It's not the other people mm. thinking that. Right. And I can tell you as an, introvert, I can really relate to that because I feel like, especially like as a schoolgirl, when I'm dealing with people who are as immature as I was back then, um, the extroverts would all project onto me because I was so quiet. And if you're a quiet person, all the junk in their head is just dumped on you. I'd have people mm -hmm. saying to me, I know you think I'm fat. And I'm like, I didn't think that. <laughs> you know, it was just all kinds of crazy stuff. And that's just, you know, Part of it is the age, but also it's just that we do that. You know, even as as we mature, we may not do it quite the same way or as badly, hopefully. But um, yeah, we, we do that our whole lives and we have to really watch ourselves. And the more we watch our own state of mind, the more we catch ourselves that we'd sometimes do it to other people, too. Mm. We like we think like if you have an insecurity, you're going to be imagining other people are noticing the same insecurity, right? The same thing that you're insecure about. If you imagine yourself as awkward, you imagine people see you as awkward. Or, um, and, and then it goes the other way as well. The person who's overly confident assumes everybody loves them. Right. So it goes both ways. Yeah, we're all doing that all the time and we don't necessarily catch it. But I think as an introvert, as a quiet person, um, it's more obvious to me because it's happened to me so many times. So I really relate to what Jed just said. Yeah. Yeah, and and oh. it's and it's what chains us. Like mm -hmm. it's that's the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. If only we could mm -hmm. see people as they are and not mm -hmm. project in that way, mm -hmm. we'd be so much more free. Yeah. yeah, but I do want to stress here that um, while we can apply midwifery to this, and it does have its place here, um, I don't know necessarily that that's necessarily what Plato, where Plato was going. Um, it does have an ontological reading, and we can see it in that way as well. That even like our physical world. Um, as as it really is, whatever the physical realm really is, it's not the way we experience it. We experience the physical realm through our senses. And that's what we're seeing on the wall here. And anyone who's ever meditated in like a, if, you've, if your meditations have, if your meditation practice has matured to the point where you kind of feel your body melting away, you're starting to get past those beliefs about the physical world. That's what freaks a lot of people out. That's where a lot of people turn their backs on or turn away from uh, meditation and from wisdom traditions. When it starts to actually mature and, and, you, and your physical world starts to melt away. Um, so you can see this on many levels. It's not just about false beliefs. So looking at it as like a where it's used in terms of midwifery, it's an application of it, and it certainly applies, but it's bigger than that. Everything we experience in the physical world is through our senses, and so we experience the physical world as a kind of conjecture. It's really, that's the, this goes back to book five at the end there, where he talked about um, the different cognitive functions, and they each have their own proper object, and their own proper power. So you can think of it in terms of energy, the way we experience the world at the, through our physical senses is at a lesser power than the way we experience it from a, a mental state. 
and from the state of belief. So each of the five, each of the four categories in the divided line has its own proper power and its own proper object. Mm. Okay, so the person has yeah, now. And, and oh, sorry. Go ahead. I really liked when when I suggested mm -hmm. that midwifery reading and said, oh, it's a negative projection. Mm -hmm. I like when you pointed out, oh, no, it's ne it's a necessity. Mm -hmm. And I think that brings in the physical, like mm -hmm. there is a necessity for us to project. Mm -hmm. We can't mm -hmm. assimilate all information mm -hmm. as it is. We'd be mm -hmm. over, over overwhelmed. And also there's a necessity for us to have developed these pathologos projections mm -hmm. something about our evolution required us to mm -hmm. bind together in the cave and and mm -hmm. feel like outside the cave was bad mm -hmm. and scary and not to venture forth to our highest goals but that kept us safe from saber-toothed tigers mm -hmm. in our early evolution mm -hmm. so they so there so i like when you took me away from seeing it negatively as seeing oh no it's there's a necessity for it but then you added another element. You said, um, uh, when, we, when we get into this game, we realize that we have what we need to make our evolution work. Mm -hmm. So not only is it not negative and neutral and necessary, but there might be a benefit to us having those kind of projections necessary for our own individual enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something specific about the kind of way we project that is what makes these conditions, even if we're ugly or even if we're poor, work mm -hmm. for us. So maybe there's a, a mm -hmm. like, there's a necessity or a benefit in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Does right. that fit, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to hold off, though, on commenting on it because when we get to book 10, at the very end, he ends it with an allegory, with, um, with a myth. And that's myth ties into what you're talking about, how we choose our next life. And so there's that idea of reincarnation and how we choose our next life. And what we choose may be, the t those are the tools we're going to use in our next life. And those are, that's the experiences we need to have for whatever reason, and for our learning and our growing. And so there's very much the idea, I think, if you're looking at Plato's works as an overview there's very much the idea that we are here to learn, that that's why we, why do we, why do we have all these realms and why do we even bother coming here into this physical realm where we're like chained in a cave? What is the point of it? If we are souls, why not just remain as souls and free of a body? Why do we come down into the physical world? And so that's a question that lingers in many people's minds. And I think anybody doing any kind of wisdom tradition, whether it's Plato or Hinduism or Buddhism or whatever, they have that question, why do we bother with these incarnations? What are we here to learn? And um, it is a learning experience. And so all of these different experiences, whether we deem them as positive or negative, from the perspective of the soul, they're all educational. And there is a certain perspective from which our incarnations, no matter how physically painful, no matter how emotionally painful they are, um, there's something to learn from them. And from the soul's perspective, the soul's not injured by whatever happens to the body. It doesn't necessarily injure the soul because pain and suffering are two different things, right? And the experience and what you learn from it are two different things. So you can have a negative experience, but if you pull the right lessons out, it won't damage the soul. And that's that's the the difficult part, of course, but that's the that's the goal. I would say. Yeah, the mm -hmm. difficult part is the time lag. Like hearing him mm. say, Oh, once you get to that realm, you would mm. accept even the mm. lowest position. You'd be a slave. Mm. Not just a slave to mm -hmm. someone, but someone who has no land or property. Imagine being a slave to a homeless person. That's how great this other world is compared to this world. Mm -hmm. So so from that perspective, yeah, like you can see how oh the ups and downs and the pains and sufferings I experience in this incarnation mm -hmm. is nothing compared to that world and, mm -hmm. it's, and it's all going to be great. The problem mm -hmm. is the time lag. The problem mm -hmm. is that we're here now. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, it's nice to hear mm -hmm. about that, Socrates, but while I'm in the here, it kind of sucks. Mm. But it's not as, as if you can only go to the upper world after you die. The point is to go there while you're still alive. 
But yeah, that quote that you were just referring to on page 129, um, 515D, I think it was. Yes, or 516, sorry, 516D, D or E. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fun quote because um, I think the people chained in the cave, the ones who would kill anybody who tried to free them, they feel this way about going to the upper world. Mm. I would rather be on earth, be a serf of another, a landless man and endure anything rather than opine with them and live that life. <laughs> they think those people are the ones who are caught up in a delusion and don't know yeah. reality. They think what they're experiencing is reality, right? Because remember, he says that... Um, when the person stands up and looks around, they think that what they saw before, those shadows, was more real. Yeah, and so something mm. must be causing them to mm. hold on to what's not real mm -hmm. with such fervence. Mm -hmm. And we've identified the fire as something, something about the fire has that cause that mm -hmm. binds us to our ignorance mm. so fervently when the mm. exact opposite mm. is the case. Once mm. you stick your nose out of the, mm. like above the water, you realize, no, that's where the party. Right. If you see the fire as the power of belief, then it has that power. Then, then you're seeing it that way. But then there's also the parallel to it. it, it everything you said, I agree with. And then I would also add that on the ontological level, we're seeing each realm of reality unfolding the next and into greater differentiation. And again, like that feeling of the, like the net, the image of the net, with the holes getting bigger and bigger. And so it's inevitable that falsehood is going to work into the unfolding of reality. Because on the surface, it seems like, why would the real, why would that which is real unfold that which is unreal? But it's more of a necessary mm -hmm. byproduct of the unfolding. And so... Um, this falsehood that works its way into the unfolding in our physical realm is a necessary, unavoidable thing. I'd say necessary, but maybe unavoidable is a good word. Mm. Right. So, so for, for our spiritual development, we need the sun itself mm. to be so powerful that it compels us mm -hmm. to take that mm. ascent. But as a byproduct, if something kind of looks like the sun, like a fire, then that's going to be compelling if, like if that's all that the people in the cave mm. know, so it's kind of mm. like a, uh, it's a necessary byproduct for, mm -hmm. as a result of the sun having its power. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then we can also see, I think, from this story, it helps illustrate also one thing that we saw last week was that we feel compelled, the person in section C feels compelled to hold on to their assumptions and they're not able to extricate themselves from their assumptions. It's so powerful. We, we understand that in the upper world, somehow we're functioning without assumptions, without concepts of the Eidos. But mm -hmm. until you get there and have such an experience, it's just impossible to, to function that way or to really understand it. And so that person feels compelled. And so much of what passes for knowledge, uh, many of the people going up the steep ascent think that they're already knowers. But notice that the person going up the ascent has his eye on the light coming through the mouth of the cave. They have their, their focus is there. But they're still in the cave. So they still have their assumptions. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Yeah, that goes back to a difficulty, right? We saw in in the divided line of the person is looking there, but they're focused there. And what is going on? You know, there's like going both directions. But I, I think this illustrates it very well. The person's looking at the light. And so they have their eye on the upper world. But they're still in the cave. They're not yet in that experience. They're not yet functioning at that energy. And so... Their assumptions haven't fully dropped away. <clears throat> and that's where, where most of us function. Right? It, it's, it's a very advanced stage to be out here. Right? It takes a very long time for most people to get out there. 
even if a person has an experience spontaneously, um, that may be what brings them into philosophy in the first place, but then all those assumptions are going to drag them down and they're going to be in that um, very arduous journey up the steep ascent. Mm. Oh, so there's kind of two levels mm -hmm. of compulsion in that sense. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have an uh, experience or something that knocks your chains free and compels mm. you to stand up and look mm. around but then there's the being compelled to answer questions right. about your beliefs mm -hmm. so you can free yourself mm -hmm. that level of compulsion mm -hmm. necessary otherwise right. yeah you might have an eye outside or a memory of the experience mm -hmm. but you're still stuck in the cave yeah but then there's also the old beliefs take still have hold of us and that's also compelling us to go back down in the well, cave well, mm -hmm. Right, right. So mm. the person asking questions is not just asking them questions about the outside world, compelling them to go up, but asking them questions about the the cause of their false assumptions. Mm -hmm. Sure. Like what's what caused mm -hmm. you, and that might mm -hmm. uncover the false belief. So sure. that kind of compulsion is also needed to actually mm -hmm. get out of it. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if that's compulsion, but yeah, but yeah, certainly the person feels compelled to stay in their old familiar beliefs, and. But the philosopher, the one who's going to ultimately get out, must also feel that compulsion to question their beliefs and to um, to not run away from the Socrates type, right, who is questioning them. Mm -hmm. Well, I was putting the compulsion on that Socrates type. Mm -hmm. Someone like that, like a midwife, is compelling them, hey, answer this. Hey, mm -hmm. have you noticed that? Hey, what's caused you? Hey, mm -hmm. you're acting like a tyrant. Who are you copying? Mm -hmm. That kind mm -hmm. of thing. So that mm -hmm. compulsion, I guess it also has to be matched by the participant. Yeah. They have to have the compulsion not to run away or punch mm -hmm. them in the nose That's or right. retreat. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised actually Socrates never did get punched in the face. Some of his interlocutors. Apparently. Oh, sorry. He was a badass. Like during was the he? army days, oh, he yeah, was like, yeah. he like. Mm-hmm. So maybe he's a big tough guy. I don't know. That's right. Yeah, that might be it. Um, okay. His aura. I don't mean tough physically, like his aura yeah. maybe. Right, maybe. right, right. He's know. described as having such an aura that people, when they look at him, they think, I don't want to mess with that guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus yeah. he was charming, I heard as well. Mm. Yeah, and some dialogues more than others. Yeah. He's got his moments <laughs> That's true. of charm. Yes. Um, mm. Yeah, so I think we should stop here because I don't want to go on to another section. We're actually, our time is up. And uh, as we go on, we're going to see more about the meaning of this allegory. So here we kind of outlined the allegory. It was kind of laid out for us. We discussed it a little bit, but he's going to go more into the meaning of it. And so we're going to pick up there next week. Any final comments or thoughts or anything we're good okay. i'm i'm curious mm -hmm. about what uh jacob's perspective is somebody going through it for the first time mm. no it's good i'm i'm curious if we get more into this character the socratic character that gives us the you know compelling to mm -hmm stand up mm. or um then maybe they'll go more into that mm -hmm. yeah curious we will mm. we will be nice mm. i love that that's a very socrates response when socrates <laughs> is is asked a question he he goes for the most significant thing like when somebody mentions like knowledge and wisdom and understanding mm -hmm. he'll go oh tell me more about wisdom like goes for the highest mm -hmm. same thing with parmenides parmenides can you explain a dialectic on the self so, so that response um, pinpointed the exact element that we would need. Someone needs to be a compeller. We're all stuck. Then someone has to compel us. To, someone has to free us and free us in a certain way that can um, allow us to make that ascent. So, mm. yeah, I'm glad that you went for that one. Mm. Who is that? Mm. Where, do I, where yeah. do I find one? Mm. Yeah, I could see it being a person or, or a daimon because even before... In my experience, my friend introduced me. I guess there was an experience in my life that opened me up to mm -hmm. accepting this kind of path. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and it doesn't say that it's a person who loosened the fetters. It says if a person is freed, if they drop their fetters, and it doesn't say how they did it or what compelled that to happen. Um, let me go back to that. Um, and this is back on page 123. Um, and this is around, what is the Stephanus? 515C or so. Um, when one was freed from his fetters and compelled to stand up suddenly. So it doesn't say how. But then a person starts to question them. So if it happens that you come, if you have some series of events that brings you to such a person, like Socrates who questions you, whether you're looking for the person or the person sort of finds you and just starts questioning you, and if you are um, compelled to consider those questions, um, I think you'll find that if we talk to 10 people, nine of them will have no interest at all in what we're doing, or they'll just, oh, that's interesting, and you know, and just mildly curious and walk away. But that one who is, that's the one who is compelled to stand up suddenly and turn their head. Yes, that's the you. big one. Mm. Yeah, because those who have that compulsion, thankfully we have the internet and we have your mm -hmm. channel and now yes. recently the mm -hmm. my Awakening Philosophy channel. Mm -hmm. So for those who are compelled, we have that dialogue and those questions and that support now. But yeah, it's the big question of how do we start? Like, how do we get compelled? Mm -hmm. That's the big one. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's why I'm really grateful for you, for your channel and mm -hmm. this, and Jacob here, this whole community. Yeah, we have that support now, but mm -hmm. still need something to, that divine providence mm -hmm. or that luck. I wouldn't say luck because it must be some providence of some yeah, kind. I would call it providence. Mm -hmm. mm. Although um, mm -hmm. I did ask Pierre, Dr. Pierre Grimes about this once. Um, wouldn't it therefore be necessary to do that first, to have that divine compulsion and then introduce philosophy so we, and midwifery so we can guide them and ask them the questions? Mm -hmm. And he goes, doesn't matter the order. The order doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So, because the for introduction those who haven't may be had... what inspires, yeah. Right, mm. right, 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 right. So whether you're getting the instruction and the guidance after mm. you've been freed or before, and then when it happens, you'll have something with you in your back pocket, or you'll you'll have mm -hmm. a familiarity or a relationship mm -hmm. with this community to say, "Oh, I had this experience. I want to mm -hmm. talk about it," mm. or "I had this fear of it that caused me to retreat back to the shadow." Mm. But I can recognize it because of this read along. Hmm. Um, yeah, I once heard a teacher. But it still needs that. Oh, sorry, sorry. I once heard a teacher saying that, like, it's okay if you introduce an idea and the person rejects it because they may need to hear that idea a hundred times before it takes root. And so maybe you're saying it is number 20 or number 80 and they reject it, but it still matters. It just, it won't take effect until later mm. right in the phaedo uh socrates says you got to repeat it every day mm. every right. day we talk about this and mm. it's reflected in the mythology every day they they wait in the uh in the passageway uh mm -hmm. for the to, to get let in to get let in and socrates talks about uh, uh we do philosophy until the divine self can let us in the next level mm -hmm. so that that's a real puzzle that i've had this mm -hmm. idea of purifying or, or making yourself ready to an accept an invitation um whether it's a jump or a or a, the invitation mm -hmm. was a big theme in the symposium mm -hmm. when we read that too mm -hmm. so yeah right. we've got to re keep repeating it and keep mm -hmm. coming back and, and purifying ourselves mm -hmm. through repetition yeah absolutely okay well i think we'll stop it there for today but um those of you watching on youtube if you do have any questions or comments want to jump into the discussion please put that in the, the comment section and as always i hope you'll join us next time thank you very much so like